Moving swiftly on, the next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 12667 in the name of Hugh Henry on accountability of Police Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. I'd also invite members of MSPs who are leaving the Chamber and indeed members of the public who are leaving the Chamber to do so quickly and quietly, please. I now call on Hugh Henry. Seven minutes, Mr Henry. Microphone for Mr Henry, please. OK. Thanks, President Officer. Um, two years ago, the Scottish Police Force, uh, Police Scotland, was set up um, by, emer by merging uh, the previous eight forces. Now, that was done with some controversy. There were those who believed that there should be no change. Some believed that there should be three forces. And, of course, the Scottish Government view, which was supported by Scottish Labour, prevailed that a single force could operate. I think, however, experience in those two years would give us all grave concern about what has been happening. And one of the things that I think we need to put on record is that any criticisms are not criticisms of uniform staff or civilian staff who are working tirelessly to make sure that our streets and our communities are kept safe and secure. But, President Officer, it is troubling when we see issue after issue being raised in the press and coming to this Parliament, where we have inconsistency and where we have stories changing almost by the hour. Because if we cannot have a police force that we can rely on in terms of what they are saying, then it does undermine the political confidence, but it also undermines the public confidence. And even when it comes to the consultation that has been conducted by Police Scotland on what confidence the public has, there has been controversy over who has been asked uh, about the confidence, with uh, reports that many people who have been stopped by the police, such as motorists, um, uh, do not count towards the, the, the statistics that are not asked in terms of their experience. So what's behind all of this? And there is a fault and there is a problem on three levels. There is a level political, because this was created by the Scottish Government. They did not take into account advice and concerns, and they steamrollered, they used the majority to impose a structure and a method of operation that they thought was most appropriate. There is a problem with the creation of the so-called uh, body set up to hold Police Scotland to account, the Toothless Tiger, the Scottish Police Authority, that is largely ineffective and that comes to the game almost inevitably after events take place, rather than setting out its policies and its expectations in advance. And therefore, what we have is a, a setup where the third party in it, Police Scotland, is having to make the best of what has been given to it and, frankly, is struggling to cope. We've got a problem straight away with the budget and we had the debacle of the Public Audit Committee of this Parliament in its scrutiny uh, of the Audit Scotland report on the police budget. Um, where the concerns of members and indeed where the concerns of witnesses were taken out of the final report by the SNP majority and where myself at that time as the convener along with Tavi Scott and Mary Scanlon were forced to issue in an un unprecedented manner a minority report trying to reflect some of the problems that were in being imposed on Police Scotland because of the finances and the way that the money uh, was, was being delivered to them. And that is all too typical of this process. We have had constant bleats from the SNP government 
that Westminster should sort out their VAT problem. Now, there is a debate to be had about VAT, but at the same time, we have Treasury Ministers saying in 2011, the Scottish Government were explicitly advised of the potential consequence of changing from regional police forces to a single authority as part of a proposed revised funding model. At the time they took the decision, they would have known they would be no longer eligible for VAT refunds, refunds as a result. So this comes from the Scottish Government. We've had the debacle of stop and search, where tens and hundreds of thousands of people are being stopped and searched in a level that we don't even see in the Metropolitan Police, where the evidence and the assurances of Police Scotland don't seem to be worth the paper that they are written on, where the story changes, where this, this Parliament has promised that stop and search of under-12s would be stopped, only to find out that it's still continuing. We then have the mess of data being lost because apparently someone pressed a button and lost the, 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 the information, which actually beggars belief because I don't know of many data systems that would be so vulnerable to such a loss of sensitive data as, as that, that one person pushing one button could uh, in, enable information to be lost. We have civilian staff uh, working under pressure uh, in March 2010, there were 7,862 staff. In December 2014, there were 5,619, a loss of 2,243 staff and more jobs looming. As we heard earlier on from Willie Rennie, staff under pressure, sickness and stress levels on the increase, where we have police officers, despite what the chief constable and senior staff say, police officers backfilling the jobs of civilian staff jobs that they are not trained to do and incidentally jobs that they are not paid to do when they should be out on the streets keeping communities safe. We have the problem that Willie Rennie mentioned of control rooms. We have the skewed consultation. We have the loss of data. We have been told by the Chief Constable that there are no targets and yet we hear from former officers that the stop and search figures not only have been invented but yes that there are targets. Callum Steele, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Police Federation, said we have police officers that are making numbers up. But also we know, and I have just met this week with retired police officers from across the country who are telling us they have targets, they have key performance indicators. So we have problem after problem. We have duplicity uh, at every turn from you know, quarters that should not be involved in that. We have two creatures the Scottish Police Authority and Police Scotland, created by the Scottish Government. We have debacles sponsored by the Scottish Government. And it's really time now, Presiding Officer, for the Scottish Government to take some responsibility for its decisions and to sort this mess out once and for all. Many thanks. We are extraordinarily tight for time today, so I'm going to have to confine members to four-minute speeches. Uh, Roderick Campbell to be followed by Margaret Mitchell, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I apologise to the Member and to the Chamber for the fact that I will not be able to stay for the whole debate of another commitment? Uh, when I first read the motion today, I thought we might be focusing on the proposal to consider the merger uh, of Renfrewshire and Inverclyde Division of Police Scotland with that of Argyll and Western Bartonshire, which is currently on, going out to consultation. But it seems that the thrust of this Member's debate is somewhat far-ranging. The motion does refer to the second anniversary of Police Scotland, and I think we should all recognise these are early days for a body which marks a radical change to policing in Scotland. With the best will in the world, to evaluate that change now would fail to do it justice. The 1st of April 2013 was the start of reform, not the end. But that does not mean that lessons cannot be learned at this stage. The loss of data was a clear embarrassment. And for example, in relation to armed policing, I think that Police Scotland and the SPA were slow to respond to the need for public engagement about the deployment of firearms, especially in non-life-threatening situations. But even then, we should not overestimate the number of officers involved. Indeed, 98% of officers in Scotland are unarmed. The SPA scrutiny report in January this year was thorough. In compiling it, there were public evidence sessions, an academic report and surveys of opinion together with 200 responses to a public call for evidence. And not just the SPA, but HMI, CS are taking a very active interest in this issue. This is not an issue that is being overlooked. 
and on Stop and Search, as we know the Cabinet Secretary is awaiting an update from Police Scotland by the end of the month. We know that the Chief Constable is minded to stop the practice of consensual searches, but is consulting, although according to a newspaper opinion poll, the majority of people surveyed support consensual stop and search, and the Scottish Police Federation has defended the use of stop and search. So there is a debate to be had. And of course, at the latest SBA board meeting to consider stop and search, the Chief Constable himself acknowledged mistakes had been made. He apologised and said lessons would be learned. This is simply not the mark of an unaccountable officer. He is well used to the need to be accountable. Indeed, I am reminded of the comment of Councillor Stephen Curran, a Labour councillor from the old Strathclyde Police Board, who told the Justice Committee on the 20th of March 2012, when we were considering the police reform bill at stage one, that, quote, we are quite fortunate in that the Chief Constable was, to put it bluntly, used to more robust accountability in England in the Metropolitan Police. He is used to being questioned. Mr Curran was speaking, of course, of Chief Constable Stephen House. If there are any shrinking violets on the SBA, they should take heart. And speaking of shrinking violets, we have, of course, our own police subcommittee, chaired by Christine Graham, proving that this Parliament takes its role in holding Police Scotland to account very seriously indeed. It's right and proper, time is tight, I'm afraid. It's right and proper that there is parliamentary scrutiny. But perhaps we ought also to consider the positives. A national force under the SBA that has achieved efficiency savings of 130 million in its first two years, that has maintained police numbers, recognising that the ultimate configuration of staff resources is a matter both for itself and the Scottish Police Authority being committed to no compulsory redundancies, and I hope of the need to engage fully with representatives of police staff who we have to accept are at the sharp edge of the tight financial constraints we operate in. A national force that has presided over a 40-year low in crime figures, for which some credit should go to them, for their professionalism, and we should also appreciate the benefits that a national force can provide in accessing specialist services in any part of Scotland. Presiding officer, despite the inference in the motion, I believe that public confidence in the police force remains high. In my view, in our pursuit of accountability, we should take care not to undermine that confidence. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Graham Pearce. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I thank you, Hen Henry, for bringing this important debate to the Chamber and apologise for having to leave after making this contribution. There's no doubt that in the two years Police Scotland has been in existence, it has not had its problems to seek with the same issues about lack of transparency and accountability and, pure and poor communication problems arising. In terms of the legislation, the case for the introduction of a single police force was predicated on the potential savings and the assertion that the pooling of resources would avoid duplication and be more efficient. Crucially, despite the Conservatives and others pressing for a full business case to be carried out, this was point-blank refused by the then Cabinet Secretary for Justice and the Scottish Government. Consequently, decisions have been taken which I don't believe would have been approved or even been suggested had the Scottish Government been required to produce a full business case. It was the Government's failure, however, to give assurances about local accountability, which meant that the Scottish Conservatives could not support this legislation. Furthermore, in terms of oversight, it is far from satisfactory that under the legislation, the head of the SPA owes their position to the patronage of Scottish ministers, and there is clearly much more work to be done before the SPA effectively fulfils its role in scrutinising and holding the Chief Constable to account. Stop and search is a case in point where there is evidently at the very least a lack of communication between the Chief Constable, who has been adamant that no volume target setting has taken place, and Callum Steele representing the rank and file officers who stated that the numbers driven target approach to stop and search was ill conceived and resulted in attention being directed towards meaningless numbers. Decisions to cut almost now 1,600 support staff have meant that, again, despite the Chief Constable's assurance to the contrary, backfilling is prevalent in, and serving officers are being removed from frontline duty to carry out administrative tasks previously undertaken by civilian support staff. 
The 2012 Act sought to strengthen the connection between services and communities. Instead, there has been a centralisation of the service with the closure of police counter, uh, counters replaced with an automa uh, automated 101 number. It is therefore virtually impossible for the public in the areas where these closures have hit to have a face-to-face -face discussion with a police officer at a time of their choosing. Furthermore, the closure of control rooms means valuable local knowledge is lost, resulting in officers unfamiliar with the area, unable to locate the locus they are required to attend. This was confirmed by the participants at the Justice Committee's recent roundtable discussion on rural crime. It is for the reasons listed above that the Scottish Conservatives some time ago now called for a review of the oversight of Police Scotland. Given our concerns about the lack of local accountability have proved justified, it is now time to rethink how best the service can be made more responsive and tailored to the needs of local communities. This will require flexibility in decision making in order to deliver the service which our local communities and the public has a right to expect to keep their, safe, their streets safe. Thank you very much. I now call on Graham Pearson to be followed by Alison McInnes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First, can I record my absolute gratitude and praise for those police officers and support staff across Scotland who perform duty on behalf of the public, on behalf of my family, on behalf of me. Uh, I do uh, value the work that they do daily, largely unseen and largely unapplauded. Second, I remember today in the lead up to the second uh, anniversary of Police Scotland, those staff members who were let go over the last couple of years, many of whom were highly professional, highly committed, and suffered a great deal of stress and loss as a result of the policies that have been pursued uh, through the development of Police Scotland. Thirdly, before I, I go into the main part of, of my speech, I acknowledge that neither the Cabinet Secretary nor the Minister were responsible for the current situation that we find ourselves with Police Scotland. Although a member of the Government Party, they played no significant part in the debates that we held at that time. And as a result, I offer that they are in a supreme situation of being able to learn the lessons of the last couple of years and repair what is wrong, rather than trying to defend the indefensible. Uh, what uh, I would offer is that from the outset there were concerns around the Chamber that governance and accountability had been overlooked. In the debates at the Justice Committee, I specifically asked back in 2011 of the Chief Constable, Mr Smith, who was in charge of reform at that time, how will concerns that develop at local boards be represented at national board level? Has there been any discussions about that link? The response from the Chief Constable, no. And our submission would be that there is a gap in the bill. At a previous meeting of the Justice Committee, I asked of Robert Black his view of the arrangements for proper governance. I would remind the Chamber Robert Black was much appreciated as someone who knew about accountability and knew about how to deliver uh, governance in a real sense. He described the arrangements in the bill as revealing a democratic deficit. And we have carried the burden of that deficit ever since. We saw for some nine months some shadow boxing between a chief constable and a convener about the job's worth and about how their role and their position would be seen. And as a result, that whole business of governance was overlooked. By October 2012, it was reported in Holyrood magazine in a portfolio that Emery, and I presume that's Mr Emery, has already gone on record to stress the need for good governance and strategic leadership. October 2012. It seems to me that Mr Emery and his board believe that governance and, and leadership equals review and post-scrutiny. That's not what an SPA should be about. 
I would also re remind the Minister that we call for a business case so we could see how we would deliver on reform in the long term. It has yet to arrive. We were told that reform would need a real change in the way that police officers work. We are waiting for an IT system that would allow that to develop. In finishing, what we require for the current arrangements is a board that stands at its height, that exercises true governance, a whole environment which operates through candour, honesty and openness. And I would stress that the subcommittee of this parliament does its work effectively, but it has neither the time nor the stature that it deserves. And regularly members complain that the time is short and that lunchtime is no time to do the important work of scrutiny in this Parliament. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. We now call on Alison McInnes to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to Hugh Henry for securing this debate. Members know Scottish Liberal Democrats were the only party to consistently oppose the abolition of valued local police services in favour of the creation of a national force. And we base that on reasonable principled concerns. The centralised force would be unaccountable. It could never be as responsive to the needs of our communities. The numbers didn't stack up and savings claims were unrealistic. And it would lead to a further disproportionate loss of civilian staff and backfilling by frontline officers. Members, it gives me no pleasure whatsoever to see these concerns and more realised. Like Hugh Henry, let me put on record again my gratitude to the officers and civilian staff at the front line who do keep our communities safe. But, presiding officer, the way Scotland does policing has changed, and not for the better. There has clearly been a shift towards a narrow enforcement model of policing preoccupied with targets. But as we approach the force's second birthday, we are still being hindered, obstructed even, in scrutinising its policies, its practices and performance. It has required real persistence to expose an illiberal system of stop and search, plagued by recording problems. People were rightly alarmed that the SPA seemed unaware for well over a year that armed police were undertaking routine duties. Parliament wasn't even informed. The number of police officers as announced every three months was tedious fanfare, but it's left to others to expose backfilling and to calculate 1,400 civilian staff have lost their jobs. And just this week, we learnt more key statistics are to be published late. Six months late. None of this was volunteered. It has consistently required our constituents, the media or opposition politicians to un uncover the truth. It shouldn't be difficult to find out what is really going on, either on our streets or behind closed doors at Central Police Headquarters. People have a right to know if the way they are being policed has changed. Public engagement and accountability are fundamental principles of policing by consent. In its infancy, the National Force has repeatedly chosen not to be wholly upfront with either Parliament or the Scottish Police Authority, to which it is supposedly accountable. Senior officers seem to operate on a need-to-know basis, limited to their own ranks. This lack of transparency is allowed to happen because, as the motion notes, the SPA has proven ineffective and lacking in clout. It isn't conducting scrutiny in the way that it ought to. The Chair told me during Justice Subcommittee on the 21st of August 2014, we make recommendations and ask the Chief Constable questions. Normally, we see such things after the fact. Well, it doesn't exactly inspire confidence, does it? The body which is supposed to lead the scrutiny of the National Forces policies and performances is constantly playing catch-up. The SPA needs to be much more proactive Interrogate the competence and merits of policies before they are enacted, not months later. And don't be deflected by cries of operational independence. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government must take responsibility. It used its majority to force through the fundamentally flawed legislation which has caused so much of this sorry mess. And yet, since the inception of Police Scotland, ministers haven't scheduled a single debate in its own time to reflect upon and discuss the impact of policing reform. The most critical whole-scale reform for a generation. I think that's extraordinary. I think it's a dereliction of duty and it's disrespectful of this parliament. Instead, it has been left to Liberal Democrats and other opposition parties to highlight issues using our members and opposition business debates. The Scottish Government cannot pass the buck. It can't pass legislation and then wash its hands of the results. 
it is high time ministers tackled these problems head on and told members here in Parliament how they're going to sort things out. Many thanks. I now call on Christine Graham to be followed by John Finney. Deputy Presiding Officer, it has become standard and welcome practice, though we are not obliged to do so, to congratulate the member on securing a member's debate. Regrettably, for the my first time in 16 years here taking part in these debates, I can't do so. You see, I'm reading the motion, listening to the debate, and asking myself, is this a member's or an opposition debate? Technically, of course, it fulfills the criteria 4.2c of the guidance and motions. It must raise issues commemorating anniversaries or mark national weeks or special events to have cross-party support. But, presiding officer, there is a world of difference between the letter of the law and the spirit. And I think this sails close to an abuse of parliamentary procedures. I find this additionally disappointing, given that Hugh Henry, like myself, aspired to be presiding officer, and I would have thought he would have demonstrated more respect for parliamentary processes. This is an opposition debate in all but name, but safe from meaningful Point amendment order, and Hugh indeed Henry. a vote. I am willing to take all the criticisms that Christine Graham makes if I have been proved to have stepped beyond the rules of this parliament. Could you uh, indicate to me whether this was a competent motion and whether it's an appropriate one for members' debate? It is a competent motion, Mr Henry, and once it was passed by the Bureau, that is why we are debating it today. There was no objection to this at the Bureau, so Ms Graham, please continue now. Thank you, Deputy President. I acknowledge that, and I think we need to change our rules. I've written to standards to ask them in the light of this debate. But, of course, this makes it safe from meaningful amendment or, indeed, a vote. Of course, Hugh Henry, as Justice Spokesman, is new to his job and, I think, is not up to speed. I think we have in Parliament very rigorous scrutiny of Police Scotland and the SPA since it came into being either through the full Justice Committee, which does not have an SNP majority, or the subcommittee, which also does not have an SNP majority, and whose members were appointed by Parliament to represent the remits of justice, equal opportunities, and local government. We have held 29 meetings since it was established in March 2013. The main topics have been armed police, stop and search, local policing, complaints and investigations, the I-6 programme, the new police custody arrangements, and government's issues. We know that at the start there were issues between Police Scotland and the SPA, but my goodness, we have done our damnness to hold them to account, and they have moved. Anyone who thinks that the SPA or Police Scotland have had it easy has not been paying attention. Add to that Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary. There is more scrutiny of police now than I can ever remember. You know. I would rather have in Police Scotland 17,254 full-time equivalent police officers than eight chief constables, eight deputy chief constables and all the paraphernalia that comes with them. Or indeed, what we have in England and Wales, 41 police commissioners voted in on an average 15% of those entitled to vote getting something like 80 to 100,000 a year with all the staff that comes with it. Of course it's not been perfect, but to allege that we have not been scrutinising in this parliament over two years is frankly wrong. And I return to this. I'm happy to debate this, but this, Mr Henry, should be a member's debate in this parliament. And I think to use a member's, uh, a full debate, to use it as a member's debate, frankly, is not appropriate. And as I said, I'm writing to standards to see that we change the guidance so this doesn't happen ever again. Thank you. I now call on John Finney to be followed by Hans Alan Malik. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Well, I, I would like to thank the member for bringing this debate here. It's not my intention to speak at great length about Renfrew, but I would understand that the people of Renfrew would welcome discussion. There's no harm ever come from discussion, whether that's the people of Renfrew and the people of the Highlands Islands I'm charged with representing are interested in this issue, and I'm grateful to the member for bringing the debate. Now, the debate talks about reported controversies, and one of these I was uh, um, played a part in, and that is the armed police, and that was about that's a matter that was legitimately raised by me because of public concerns, and the public concerns could have been addressed, of course, had there been consultation, indeed, had there been a community impact assessment. And that actually gets to the heart of this issue, because it's words like community and engagement is what policing should be about. Policing is something that's done 
for the people, not to the people. And uh, I hope, and I genuinely hope, there's lessons learned. I think we could have lengthy discussion about policing by consent, operational independence. I think that we could learn something. Um, the motion also talks about accountability. And where I would take exception to the member is I, I don't recall any suggested alternative structure. I may stand corrected in that from the, the Labour Party. I, for one, welcome the fact that there was council ward policing plans. I think that's very useful. I like the fact that in the local authorities, the four in the area, the four in the Highlands and Islands who were previously represented by one board, each have their own committee. But, as Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary said last week, they do need to assert themselves. And that's where this parliament can play a role in encouraging that and empowering that. We've heard from a number of people about the, uh, and indeed from, from Mr Henry, about the Scottish Police Authority. Well, it is the case that they've been absent on the big issues. They've just not been there. They've been playing catch up and they've not made a particularly good uh, job of that. Um, on the armed policing, there was the report. It comes late. I understand that it was the subject of dynamic editing or something of that nature, we're being told. So it would be, be good to understand the background to that. Again, we need a spirit of openness and transparency from Police Scotland and the Police Authority. They, they were very keen to quote the survey results. I understand they've not made these survey results available to the press. Indeed, they've told the press that they don't have these results. The press have gone to the, the company that uh, uh, produced the, the information and they've been uh, told that they've not to disclose the information to the press. Now, I understand that may breach the code of conduct for, for uh, companies, so hopefully we'll uh, see that pan out in the right way and there will be the fullest information disclosed because I would pose the question, who's accountable to whom there? Budget pressures, well, you know, the VAT issue isn't a minor issue. And if any, the energy that had gone into the swift delivery of VAT-free status to the academy schools that the Conservative and Lib Dem Party put in place, and did ski lifts, something that's important in my area, but VAT-free ski lifts, I think if there was a wall, there would have been a way to address that. There is a reversal of the civilianisation programme, as it would have been called in the early 70s, and that's disappointing. I commend the work of Unison in relation to this. I think the principle of a job requiring police powers meaning that a constable has to do it or not requiring police powers, isn't just black and white. I think there are issues around the margins that, in particularly rural areas, police officers involved in firearms inquiries and the delivery of citations has some benefit. In the short time I've left, President Officer, I want to see I served for 30 years in the police, uh, and, and like Graham Pearson, I'm very uh, uh, proud of the police service and my time there. Prior to the advent of Police Scotland, I sought and was given assurances that best practice in the constituent forces would be applied. That wasn't the case. Now, I'm not going to repeat all the, the difficulties around stop and search. There's a very clear framework in which police officers work. That's the common law and statute law. And unfortunately, the common theme in this is the direction and style of the chief constable, where creative mechanisms have been put in place. I hope that will be addressed. I certainly want to lend my very clear support to the frontline officers and the police support staff and indeed other officers who support them. I think the role for this parliament is to be a friend to the Scottish Police Service, but to be a critical friend. And I hope that there's been some constructive criticism. I've certainly heard that today. And once again, I thank the member for bringing this debate. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Hans Alan Malik, after which we'll move the closing speech to the Minister. And thank you very much and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. Please allow me to thank Hugh Henry for creating today's motion. As we approach the second anniversary of the establishment of, the, of Police Scotland, it is important that we look back to make note of the progress and of any mistakes that we've made over the past two years. It is absolutely clear that there is a great deal of work to be done in improving our police force's effectiveness and its public image. With powers like stop to search, it is critical that officers are provided with appropriate training of handling not only possible risks to themselves, but also to people with uh, mental health issues and disabilities, and in fact, people with language difficulties, and have to provide our officers with all the possible training opportunities that we can get. Data collection must be improved and better provision so that we can assure the public of its safety and its best use and appropriate use. In terms of collecting data, one should always act on the figures reached, such as the fact that only 1%, and I just repeat that for focusing on equality issues, only 1% of the police force are from the ethnic minority communities make up out of 4% of the Scottish population. It is an un, 
at utmost importance that Police Scotland can work to protect the civilians and, and, and gain their trust amongst all the communities that they serve equally. The job cuts in civilian employees and the consequences of officers being given additional responsibilities to compensate for the troubling effects of officers as well as the public um, staff, I think it's important that we, we make sure that our officers are not having to fulfill the back office jobs as they currently have to do so. It means that real officers and doing real jobs are in fact denied that opportunity to do so and uh, uh, disadvantaging the communities in getting the proper service that they're entitled to do so. This also falls to the Scottish police authorities as well as the Scottish governments. Compliancy on, this, on their parts cannot be permitted in today, day, today's day and age. So I look forward to the additional resources given to the police to help them deal with these growing challenges. The fact that our services are facing difficulties on a day in day out basis means that they need to be protected. They need to be protected and given the, the funds and the resources and the tools of the trade to carry out their duties effectively. I think that um, the fact that uh, Christine had said that uh, they have been very good in making sure that all the challenges that are facing the police force are, are dealt with, including equalities in particular, I have to say to her that uh, unfortunately that's not quite true. Uh, however, that said, I'm sure that the new cabinet secretary in his position will try his best to try and reverse that trend. I know for a fact that many of the communities are looking forward to seeing better results, better communication, and most importantly, better resources for our police services. And I mean that in the best of uh, um, help in trying to, do, to achieve that. I think that one of the things that's missing and has been missing for the last two years is that public uh, participation with the force which has been missing since the single police force that came into power. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I now call on Paul Wheelhouse. Seven minutes, Minister, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I, I welcome the opportunity to respond to uh, Hugh Henry's uh, debate and to provide balance to what I have to say uh, in Mr Henry's contribution, but not his colleagues, thankfully, was largely a uh, negative one-sided picture that uh, has been presented. At the outset, I want to highlight that not only did Labour uh, put forward support for single service, which I accept Hugh Henry acknowledged in his, his own contribution, they also voted for it at, in the Scottish Parliament. So let's not lose sight of that. There's, I think, there has been uh, some suggestion that the Scottish Government steamrolled this through using a majority. We did have support for the creation of a single police force in this Parliament. As members such as um, Roderick Campbell and Margaret Mitchell have acknowledged, um, Police Scotland is a new organisation, and so there are bound to be some teething troubles. Uh, and since um, uh, you know, we, we have acknowledged that, uh, operational policing in Scotland, though, is continuing to perform excellently. Recorded crime uh, is at a 40-year low, supported by the 1,000 extra officers we have put on our streets compared to 2007. Public confidence in our police remains high, and all of this has been achieved despite the inevitable funding pressures arising from uh, the Westminster austerity agenda, something uh, Hugh Henry uh, may wish to acknowledge, uh, but certainly those in the UK Parliament should acknowledge, uh, indeed having recently voted for a further extension of another 30 billion in austerity. So that is unlikely to help uh, the situation. The eyes of the world have been on Scotland and a great successful uh, policing contributed to the success of the City of Glasgow's hosting of the Commonwealth Games as well as last summer's Ryder Cup and of course the referendum itself. And uh, with the tragedy of the Clutha Bar helicopter crash in which let's not forget I'm sure members from Glasgow will fully acknowledge the police family lost some of its own in that uh, tragedy and the Glasgow bin lorry crash we also saw how admirably our brave police officers cope with other emergency services in very harrowing circumstances. Now, I don't doubt for one minute that members across the chamber acknowledge that. I just want to put it on the record today. Local policing shaped and delivered in communities by local commanders remains at the heart of Scottish policing. And I have to, to challenge one thing Alison McInnes said in her, in, in her own speech. In one sense, police, uh, policing in Scotland is more local than before in respect of uh, local policing plans for all 353 wards. Uh, and more through that, uh, councillors are able to have their, their say on policing in their area than uh, prior to reform. 
I do acknowledge the point Hans Ala Malik made around the uh, diversity of our police force. It's something that Police Scotland do acknowledge themselves. Clearly, at this moment in time, with the restructuring of single, single police service, it is more difficult to, to expand numbers rapidly and to, to take on new recruits. But I can assure uh, Hans Ala Malik that that is a, a priority for the Chief Constable and for Police Scotland. The true benefit, though, of a single service is that every area of Scotland now has access to specialist expertise and equipment. And I saw that for myself last month when I visited Fetty's uh, police station here in Edinburgh and met p police personnel, both two-legged and four-legged indeed, uh, from Operational Support Division. And just last week, uh, ACC Bernie Higgins highlighted the heroics of an ARV officer from that division who, anxious he may injure bystanders, did not fire on a man who was attacking with a knife and he was himself stabbed four times. These are the heroics which grab headlines, but I have seen uh, personally many other examples of excellent policing. Police working in partnership with local communities in places like Hawk Hill and Alloa, uh, a challenged community, one which falls within the bottom 15% in social index, Scottish index and multiple deprivation, but delivering a 40% reduction in crime in that area. And I recently spoke to a Police Scotland youth volunteer who had experienced difficulties, but thanks to his role as a volunteer, and he is a member of the ethnic minority community himself, turned his life around and now wants to become a member of Police Scotland himself. And uh, if it could be brief, please. John Finney. Intervention. I wonder if the Minister would acknowledge that that good work, and we're all aware of it, is likely to put in jeopardy, for instance, if there was a, a stop and search campaign that was targeting some of these areas in an inappropriate way, as we've heard with the use of consensual search. Paul Wheeler. We'll come to, to stop and search. I acknowledge the point that, that, that uh, John Finney makes, but hopefully I'll be able to respond to that. Um, and even in my own constituency, except in a rural part of Scotland, PC Jamie, a local constituency policeman who visits local schools to talk to local children, providing inspiration and advice to them. This, not the, perhaps the negative motion we have before us today, is a, perhaps, in my view at least, a truer reflection of policing in Scotland uh, in 2015. And I'm sure all members will have their own stories. Uh, I'm push for time, I'm afraid, um, I, unless the presiding officer will let me... Highly up to you, Minister. Uh, well, I may have to press on. I'm sorry to, to Mrs McInnes. Um, I'm sure all members will have their own stories. I want to focus briefly on England and Wales. Reform is safeguarding all we value in policing from Westminster budget cuts. And we only have to look south of the border. I know it's a point that some members will be uncomfortable with. Uh, I would like to finish this point, please. Where officer numbers and morale are rock bottom to see the benefits of our approach. Had we mirrored the calamitous approach of the UK government, we would have 2,688 fewer officers than our commitment of 17234. That would take one in six officers out of the service. And, uh, you know, that perhaps is a good example of dereliction of duty. I'll take Alison McInnes at this point. Alison McInnes. The Minister hasn't Microphone. addressed any of the challenges, any of the challenges and shortcomings that have been raised today. That is quite inappropriate. I may say to Alison McInnes, I'm taking an intervention from a colleague from the other side of the chamber and indeed from yourself. I'm trying to engender a debate here and I'm getting on to accountability and governance issues. Presiding officer, Scotland's police officers play a vital and visible role in our communities right across Scotland, but the contribution of Police Scotland support staff, as has been acknowledged by members, I fully recognise it is crucial. Staff numbers are declining, that is to our great regret, but as Police Scotland and SPA always said they would, but we remain committed to no compulsory redundancies. Voluntary redundancy or voluntary early retirement is offered to staff as well as the opportunity to relocate or retrain. But let me be clear, further austerity will not help, um, and we really do have to strike back about the austerity agenda. I know it's a particularly challenging time for staff, but I recognise and I want to thank them for their continuing dedication and commitment in delivering that 40-year low in crime. In terms of the police budget, budgets are tight across the public sector, not just in policing, clearly as a consequence of the budget pressures we face at Scottish Government level. And it's a prudent government that we are in, and we need to cut our cloth accordingly, but that is also what Police Scotland are trying to do. And great progress is being made in delivering the necessary savings, with around 880 million of cumulative savings of the projected 1.1 billion already having been delivered. Presiding officer, these uh, challenges that have, we have experienced have been acknowledged. And uh, I can say one thing to John Finney, who I do respect very much. I, I asked how many complaints there had been received about the armed policing uh, prior to May the 12th when he first raised the issue, and I'm told there's only one had been received by Police Scotland at that stage, and since then only 27 further complaints have been received. Driving officer policing is now more accountable and transparent than ever. Sometimes scrutiny can be uncomfortable, but there is no doubt it is beneficial in the long run. 
and I believe Police Scotland will respond and be the better for that. I welcome, very much welcome, the work Police Scotland and SPA are undertaking with the support from Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary. Clearly there are lessons which can be learned. I do acknowledge that, particularly in relation to engagement between the two organisations to ensure the SPA can hold Police Scotland to account effectively and at the right time. I know that the Chief Constable himself and the Chair of SPA are committed to tackling these issues and the whole Chamber should welcome that and support that process in a constructive manner. The scrutiny of this Parliament is essential in supporting the successful reform of policing in Scotland. However, let's do recognise the progress that has been made to date. Presiding officer, our police officers and police staff are doing an excellent job. Most of us take that protection for granted, but my visit to FETI has brought home to me just how brave our police officers are and how dangerous, just how dangerous a job they do in many cases. They have delivered uh, for Scotland, and we should thank them and support them in their often difficult and very dangerous work. Police Scotland and the SPA recognise the challenges and opportunities ahead and are working closer, closely together to deliver best possible police service for the, the people of Scotland. And I, for one, am grateful for the professionalism and dedication in doing that. And we acknowledge concerns where they arise, and I'm sure that the Police, uh, police Scotland, the SPA, the Chief Constable, are uh, taking note of the points that have been made today in the Chamber and will respond in due course. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And thank you all for taking part in this important debate. And I now suspend Parliament until 2.30.